This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to look at Bible prophecy, specifically the famous prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 38, also known as the War of Gog and Magog. And for most of you who are familiar with that passage, that's the account, the supernatural prediction of the prophet Ezekiel that in the last days there will be this enormous invasion against the physical land of Israel. And this enormous invasion will be led by, many Bible scholars believe, Russia and an alliance of militant Islamic nations such as Persia or modern-day Iran, Syria, and many other nations. Now, why this is of particular interest to us today is that recently our government, under the orders of President Trump, uh, destroyed one of the world's most powerful uh, militant terrorist leaders who uh, allegedly and I say allegedly, it's, it's, I guess, fairly commonly agreed, uh, was financed and supported by um, Iran. Uh, because Iran has all kinds of military operatives, and Iran has many of their people in the modern nation of Iraq. And this particular individual was the, the number one general, the number one general that had this incredible loyalty to him directly from his troops. And this is a very important thing to grasp because you could take any given nation, including the United States, but specifically uh, in many of these foreign nations and especially uh, militant Islamic nations, And you may have, in any given particular nation, uh, Pakistan, for example, uh, you may have 100 to 300 generals or or very very high-level military officers, and the, the, the personal loyalty of their troops is, is yes, to their nation, but it's, it's very concentrated and very divided up. Um, to specific uh, generals and high-ranking military officers that they serve under. So if you take any given nation, you'll have the military and the, the actual military troops. They are fiercely, often fiercely and passionately loyal to the names of particular generals or high-ranking military officers. So what you have is kind of a, kind of a division in these militant Islamic countries. There is somewhat of a division internally uh, regarding the loyalty of, of, of the troops, of the soldiers. And so if something happens to that nation, if that nation's in t- attacked or that uh, nation's uh, involved in a war or whatever, the, who who their troops are actually going to follow uh, in a time of crisis, who the troops are actually going to follow and actually obey or actually go to warfare for has a great deal to do with what individual they're actually loyal to. And in that way, it's it's different than the United States of America because the U.S. military chain and co- chain of command in, in all of our branches of the military is, for the most part, the average soldier is loyal to, to the uh, uh, United States of America. So this makes the situation, uh, or this particular major terrorist leader was taken out, using it, weapons that are so advanced um, a very high technology, very, very powerful drone uh, 
never seen, as far as I know or as far as I've read, never seen an open operation before. In fact, the drone which took out this terrorist leader was of such an advanced state that many people in our own military didn't even know we had that capability. Many people uh, and militaries across the world didn't know we had uh, that level of capability. And so it stunned and shocked people all around the world, including those in Iran. And of course, it shocked those within the uh, terrorist organizations. Because what it revealed, and it's, it's really a tragedy that the uh, mainstream media um, so superficially uh, and, and one-dimensionally covers the news that they never give you any of the, the, the important background information so you can make sense out of it. It's a very, all of the mainstream media basically gives you a cartoon-like uh, reporting of the news. So it makes it hard to really know what's going on. But back to this technology, this drone technology, this was highly advanced drone technology. Um, I believe the drone was flying somewhere at 50,000 feet uh, above the ground. Could see with almost microscopic accuracy what was happening on the ground. And when the order was given to take out this terrorist leader, it, it was able to do it instantly with, with, with surgical precision. But what a lot of people didn't realize, what a lot of people didn't understand, was that although that's the first time we have openly displayed that technology and usage, we have had that highly advanced drone technology for, I don't know, how many years we've actually had it for, but let's say approximately 10 years. It could be longer. So let's just say we, we've had the drone, that highly advanced drone technology for somewhere around 10 years already. Well, what that means is that for the last 10 years, any president of the United States of America of either party could have at any time they chose they could have chosen to give the order using that highly advanced drone technology to um, strike and kill the, the, perhaps the most powerful terrorist leader in the world. This could have been done at any time in the last 10 years, but it was done now. So there's, there's two uh, fallouts from that. And one is, uh, the debate obviously is whether or not it was prudent from a military standpoint or a geopolitical standpoint or a political standpoint to do that, even though you have the capability. Um, there's that debate. And then there's the other debate, um, which is, we any for anybody who's paying attention, and this is what the news media should have reported, but of course they didn't. For anybody who was paying attention, it revealed to the world the, the extent and power of the U.S. military is unparalleled because it wasn't the, the, the news media, the mainstream media and their usual cartoon channel reporting made it sound like, well, we had just developed this new technology and that enabled us to take out this terrorist, and we couldn't have done it before. But that is absolutely not true. We've had this technology, let's say, for about a decade, and we could have at any moment within the last 10 years taken out this top-level uh, terrorist leader. And the other thing that this uh, taking out of the terrorist leader revealed was that this terrorist leader even though the news media, and perhaps that was their job, perhaps they were told to for classified reasons to not tell the American public, but the news media um, did not and has never mentioned the fact that 
The fact that we took him out with this advanced technology, and we've had this advanced technology for about 10 years, means that this highly powerful terrorist leader was under the direct surveillance and monitoring of the United States of America just about every second of his life for the last 10 years. So although you heard all this reporting about how we can't find him and he's in hiding and you know it's impossible to locate him as the excuse why they didn't apprehend him or or destroy him the reality is he was in a close up uh lens being photographed by a combination of our satellite technology our drone technology and other technology in other words he was in he was under our microscope so to speak so this entire 10 years or whatever it's been, this terrorist leader has been under our microscope. We knew exactly where he was 24-7. And that's part of the big, big news is just how powerful the American military technology is. He was literally under our microscope. He was under our thumb for over 10 years. Think about that. Now, for, for specific reasons, he was taken out, and you may or may not agree with those reasons. And my job, by the way, is not to be an advocate for, yes, we should have taken him out, or no, we should not have taken him out. That's not my, uh, my assignment. I'm simply pointing out the fact that the, the decision to take him out could have been made in, at any time. And why it's important from a spiritual standpoint is because the nation that he essentially was working for, the nation that was financing him, is Iran or Persia. Persia, Persia and Iran are the same thing, biblically, the same nation. And, and so in chapter... Uh, 28 of Ezekiel, we read about this war of Gog and Magog, which depicts a futuristic war in the last days, headed up by Russia, but the number two nation that heads it up is modern-day Iran or Persia. They invade the Middle East in a massive military inva invasion, featuring many other Islamic nations. And Iran is an absolutely key leader in this invasion. That is why anything that goes on with Iran, the Middle East, Russia, China, Israel, the U.S., war, uh, that's why all of that is of vital interest to Christians from a spiritual standpoint if you are a student of Bible prophecy, because Iran plays such a critical role in the last days in Bible prophecy. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. You can visit paulmcguire.us to watch so many videos we have, uh, prophetic emergency alert videos, Paul McGuire Report, radio programs, uh, conferences, articles, Books like the brand new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And you can get all this stuff at paulmcguire.us and, of course, spread the links uh, to people that need to know, not from a cartoon channel perspective, but people that need to know uh, the truth. Because Jesus Christ said, The truth shall set you free. Visit paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in a second. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. Remember to send links of this program to help people you know know the truth so that they can be set free by sending them the link of this program and send it to them personally. That, that way they'll take a look at it and they'll benefit from uh, the contents in it because the contents deal with life and reality uh, from a much deeper perspective, not a cartoon channel perspective. So let's go back 
And by the way, you cannot understand <laughs> what's happening, happening in the Middle East today. You cannot possibly understand it, not even remotely understand it. It's impossible to understand what's happening in the Middle East today without having a knowledge of Bible prophecy, period. I mean, it's not like, it's not even a debate. You have to understand Bible prophecy. Now, um, the vast majority of our media and the majority of the American people have a bias against Bible prophecy, so they, they can't report effectively on the Middle East or, or much else because they have a bias against Bible prophecy. So let's look at, for example, a passage of Scripture from the book of Zechariah, um, where the prophet Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, says these words of warning. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So here we see a future time in the last days, a prophecy being made by the prophet uh, Zechariah. We see that in the last days, Israel is going to be invaded by a massive army headed up by the nation of Russia. Because it says um, in Zechariah, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. And then at the latter part of verses, chapter 12, 2 to 3, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So here's an implication that all the people, all the nations of the earth at one time will be gathered against Jerusalem. Now, this could refer to, by the way, uh, the War of Armageddon. Some scholars believe this does refer to the War of Armageddon. Some scholars believe that the War of Armageddon and Ezekiel 38 are, is simply, they believe these, Ezekiel 38 is simply a battle in the War of Armageddon. So there are, so there are some variations of the interpretation, but the interpretation essentially stands. And, and the, the majority of this prophecy comes from I said earlier, Ezekiel chapter 28, excuse me, I meant Ezekiel chapter 38, the war and Magog passages of scripture come from Ezekiel uh, 38. So in Ezekiel 38, starting in verses 1 to 6, it says this, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief, the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saying the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the ch chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all shine, and all shine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, or, 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 or Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomar, of the north quarters, all his bands, and many people with thee. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we see that many of these nations exist today, <clears throat> and many of the, the, the words regarding these nations refer to nations that exist today. So, God 
is in charge of all of human history. This prophecy was made thousands of years ago. And God was able, and is still able, God sees the end from the beginning. God's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God lives outside of space and time. So he doesn't have our limited finite perspective where the only thing we can see is, you know, basically what's in front of us. God has an infinite perspective. He can see outside of space and time. And he writes it down through his prophets in the Bible. And so many prophecies in the Bible, all the prophecies in the Bible that were supposed to come true at a particular time period have already come true. 100% accuracy. And then there's all the other prophecies in the Bible that are not designed to come true until a certain point in the last days, such as Ezekiel chapter 38. So what we read about is that Russia uh, and former republics in the USSR And you have to explain what the USSR is today because people forgot. Communist Russia today was formally known as the Soviet Union, and it formally also was known as the USSR, um, which was kind of like the Russian equivalent of the USA. The USSR is the United Soviet Union. Stations Republic or Nations Republic. It's a republic of independent uh, um, nations that were under one umbrella known as the USSR, where today it's called Communist Russia. And so a lot of, uh, of the military and eco- economic allies of today's giant Communist Russia were formerly under the umbrella of the USSR, like parts of Eastern Europe and uh, uh, parts of the Middle East, etc. So, God calls the prophet Ezekiel to give a prophetic warning that is directed to all the nations of the far north, the far north of Israel, and to the uttermost north of Israel, by the way, Russia is located. So Ezekiel was among the Jewish uh, captives that were taken into captivity when those in Jerusalem were invaded by the Babylonians and taken into captivity by the Babylonian troops. Um, when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, gave the orders uh, for Babylon to invade Jerusalem and take the people into captivity. Now, what's interesting is is that the, this is the same uh, King Nebuchadnezzar that, that the prophet Daniel is interpreting uh, his dreams and images. This is the same King Nebuchadnezzar who frees the Jews that are in captivity, uh, partially because of the spiritual intercession of the prophet Daniel. So this is very interesting how the entire book of the Bible is integrated. And remember, when the prophet Daniel is is praying, uh, what is the key that opens the door for these two archangels, these two highest powerful angels of the Lord, what allows these angels of the Lord, these very most powerful angels of the Lord, to to be released to battle these high-level territorial spirits of Lucifer, such as the king of Persia, or the king of Iran, or the king of Grisha, or the king of, of, or, or the head of Europe, the territorial spirit over Europe. What causes that to happen? Well, remember, the key to the change in the battle, the key to the change in the direction of the battle, is the prophet Daniel comes to the Lord and begins to repent of his own personal sins. And then as an intercessory prayer warrior, 
the prophet Daniel begins to repent of the sins of God's people and how they have broken the laws of God. And then he asks God, he petitions God. So, why we know this is of enormous significance, why we know this is the key to the change in direction of the, of the great spiritual battle, is because the Bible tells us that it is. So, imagine this. You have these giant super angels, Michael the archangel, Gabriel the archangel. One of Michael's jobs as God's, one of God's highest ranking angels, one of Michael's jobs is to watch over the nation of Israel. And the uh, archangel Gabriel has many high-level jobs. But you see, they can't, they can't come to Daniel to answer his prayers. And Daniel can't get in physically into uh, Persia. Excuse me. Uh, Daniel can't get into Babylon. Uh, and God wants to use Daniel in Babylon because these spiritual forces are blocking Daniel's entrance in. So what is it? And this is important to pay attention here, because the lesson that Daniel had to learn is the lesson that you and I have to learn, and the lesson that the church has to learn in America and around the world in order for us to operate as victorious Christians. If we do not know how to wage spiritual warfare effectively, we will never see warfare, I'm talking about law-abiding, peaceful warfare, in the visible realm will never be realized. We will never see victory in the visible realm, occupy until I come, until we first see victory in the invisible realm or the spiritual world. So Daniel's praying, and the archangel make a Michael and Daniel are battling the territorial spirits of the prince of Persia or Iran, and the prince of Grecia. And, 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 and it's like a, like a stalemate. But then Daniel begins to repent before the Lord of his own sins. And then Daniel begins as an intercessor to repent before the Lord of the sins of God's people. It is that repentance in sp- in intercessory prayer specifically, you want to know how, you want to know why your prayers aren't being answered. You want to know why it doesn't seem like God is ever really answering your prayers, or you're just praying to the wall. You really want to know. You really want to be victorious, or do you want to spend? The, or do you believe your spiritual calling uh, is to be a speed bump for the rest of your life? It comes down to this. If you will be willing to get on your face before God and pray in the same manner that the prophet Daniel prayed, then you will see God do major victories in your life. And what was it that really released the power of God in a major way? It was Daniel's willingness to first repent of his own sins. Stop playing church. Stop faking it. Repent of your own sins before God. No, you don't have to publish them on your website. You repent before God of your own sins. If you sin again, you repent again. And you ask God for deliverance. And then number two is, a true Christian can never be totally selfish. So you would know in your heart and spirit that you haven't finished praying if you're just repenting of your own sins. The Spirit of God in you, if he's operating and and alive and well, would drive you to continue repenting, but to extend your repentance in intercessory prayer for God's people in America and other nations where we don't see the breakthrough we should be seeing. You know why? Because the prayers are not really entering the throne room of God properly, because people are playing church. So, so choosing to accept, you make the choice to accept the mantle of anointing 
that God wants to pour on you right now. So like right now at this second, not tomorrow, not 24 hours from now, not two years from now. Right now, the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart. In the book of Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That means the Lord is standing at the door of your heart right now, and he's knocking. And he wants to give you, at this moment, an invitation. And he's saying to you by name, I don't want to say a name, because if I neglect to say all the names, it won't be received as personal. So the Lord is speaking to you by name. He's knocking uh, at the door of your heart right now. He's calling you by name right now. And he's saying, are you willing to accept a ministry of intercessory prayer? Are you willing to be an intercessory prayer warrior for me? That's what the Lord's saying to you. And you're either ignoring him. Or you're either saying no. Most of you would never say no directly. You would kind of like say maybe and never get around to it. But in any case, you're really saying no. You're rejecting God's call to be an intercessory prayer warrior. But finally, there are you among God's faithful remnant. When you hear the Lord knock on the door of your heart and ask you to be an intercessory prayer warrior, your answer is, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, I will. And so I want to speak for a moment to those of you who have already accepted your assignment to be an intercessory prayer warrior for the Lord. And I want to speak to those of you who just accepted your assignment to be an intercessory prayer warrior for the Lord. First of all, I want to welcome you into the most incredibly phenomenal, fantastic adventure of your life. And the reason I say that with passion is because I too once lived under the delusion that being a quote prayer warrior or an intercessory prayer warrior would have been the most boring, monotonous, dry, dull, religious thing that a person could possibly do. So I once believed that delusion. And therefore, I i don't think I actually said no to the Lord. I gave one of these answers of, you know, where you kind of tell the Lord yes, but you never get around to it, which is really the same thing as saying no. And so, as the years went by, the Lord forced me through trials and tribulations to um, become an intercessory prayer warrior. And um, I went into it with some reluctance because of my prejudices, as I just shared with you. But I discovered... That being an intercessory prayer warrior for, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ was not only not boring, was one of the most awesome, fantastic, adventurous, thrilling, mind blowing, day tripping uh, adventures any individual could become involved in. I don't say anything that I just said. I don't apologize for any of it. I meant every word of what I just said, because every word of what I just said is true. And if you haven't discovered that, well, then I feel sorry for you, because you're just like I was. You, you were sucker punched by the world system into believing, because you looked at a bunch of half-hearted, half-baked Christians who, pl- who play church, and you listen to their prayers, and you went, Ugh, like you wanted to barf, <clears throat> and you wanted nothing to do with it like me, okay? But guess what? Just because they're half-hearted, there's a whole lot of what we call remnant Christians who may not make a big deal about it outwardly, but they're prayer warriors inside, and they know how to pray uh, to God, and they know how to do uh, spiritual warfare 
in God, and they are intercessory prayer warriors for the kingdom of God. And they change their lives, they change the direction of people's lives, they change the outcome of people's lives, they change the outcome of nations, and they literally, sorry for the pun, rock and roll for Jesus on, on the spiritual battlefield. And anybody who's listening to me who has prayed to God and seen awesome miracles and awesome spiritual power released by Almighty God because you hung in there and prayed, you know what I'm talking about. It's thrilling. There's nothing like it in the world. Nothing like it in the world. So what Daniel was doing was when he was engaged in spiritual warfare, you know, look, this is not meant as an anti-Catholic statement. This is not meant as, you know, I'm here to bash the Catholic uh, uh, person. But you see, in my head, uh, Protestant, uh, denominational Protestantism and, and Catholicism were basically the same. Boring. Okay? So, when I thought of intercessory prayer warfare, I thought my mind went back to when I was forced to go to Catholic religious instruction by my grandmother. And they would say, you know, endless Hail Marys and Our Father prayers repetitively. That would drive me. The monotony of that drove me crazy. Or listening to some of the boring prayers of the Protestants just bored me to, out of my mind. I, I didn't understand what happens when the power of the Holy Spirit comes down you and gives you supernaturally a prayer burden. Which reminds me, if you just said yes to the Lord that you want to be an intercessory prayer warrior for him, if you just said yes to the Lord, then all you have to do right now is reach out by faith and ask God verbally or silently if you have to, depending upon where you are. Simply ask God to fill you with the power of his Holy Spirit now and ask him to anoint you with the power of his Holy Spirit so that you can be the intercessory prayer warrior that he wants you to be. You simply come to Jesus now and say, Jesus, I choose to receive your call upon my life to be an intercessory prayer warrior. And so, Lord, I give you my life, and I ask that you would teach me how to pray supernaturally through your Spirit, and teach me how to function as an intercessory prayer warrior, Lord. I I ask you to give me the power to achieve this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you did that, then God will honor it. He, he will birth the intercessory prayer uh, warrior ministry through you. This ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church, exists because people like you are faithful intercessory prayer warriors. Without that, we would be non-existent. I mean, non-existent in the form that we wouldn't really have anything of any spiritual value to say without the intercessory prayer warriors who are praying for me, my family, and this ministry. My thanks to each one of you that have chosen to do that. In the Old Testament, as many of you know, God looked out through all the land of his people, the land of Israel, looking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap. And he looked all over the land of his people, he couldn't find one man or woman to stand in the gap as an intercessory prayer warrior. So it says, when God looked for someone to stand in the gap, it says, and he could find none. I wonder how many people in America today, or other nations, because God is looking throughout America and other nations for a man or a woman who will stand in the gap in intercessory prayer. I wonder how many he actually finds on a ratio percentage. I really don't know. But if he calls you, you certainly want to respond. So the breakthrough in this spiritual battle with Daniel, and when Gabriel finally broke through, the angel Gabriel finally broke through and came to Daniel, he said, we heard your prayers, me and Michael. We heard your prayers from the first moment that you were praying them. 
but we were involved in a spiritual battle with the Prince of Persia and the Prince of uh, Grisha, and they were blocking us from coming to you. But then the angel Gabriel said, from the first moment you started praying these prayers of repentance, from the first moment you began these intercessory prayers of repentance for God's people, it was at that moment when you began to repent, when you, got, when you stopped playing church and you got down to serious business, it was at that moment that there was a change in the direction of the spiritual battle and your prayers unleashed God's force to drive back the enemy territorial spirits. And when you began repenting and seeking God seriously, we were able to break through. And that's why I, Gabriel, are, I'm here now. And so the great spiritual victory that allowed Daniel to, to give his prophecy uh, in Babylon occurred after he learned the importance of intercessory prayer and, and obeyed it. In the same way, all of the prophecies in the book of Re- Revelation, whenever the church is around, whenever the church is here, it's never supposed to be viewing Bible prophecy with passivity and indifference. It's here for a reason. It's supposed to be involved in prayer and evangelism and intercessory prayer and so on and so forth. That's the role of the church in the last days. So, um, the Lord gave Ezekiel this prophecy as a prophetic warning to all the nations of the earth. And um, it also enabled God to free or liberate the Jews who were held in captivity. Now, um, Ezekiel, his prophecy is a, is, there's no human way anybody could have accurately predicted what was to come thousands of years ago. Okay, it, it's impossible. But Ezekiel predicted accurately Things like Ezekiel predicted the rebirth of the nation of Israel that occurred in the spring of 1948. Ezekiel predicted that Israel would arise miraculously in the future. That happened in 1948. Um, That it would be a dead nation but that it would miraculously rise to life again, which it did in 1948. Um, The Ezekiel also predicted uh, the Roman army led by the Roman general Titus uh, that would come after Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, And then, after almost 2,000 years after that, when the Jews were exiled, as predicted, uh, to all the nations of the earth, Ezekiel predicted that after this dispersion, the Jews would return to the promised land and would become, quote, a mighty army in her own ancient homeland, which is the physical land of Israel. So in 1948, Israel, way before this happened, predicted that in 1948, Israel would triumph uh, against an invasion which consisted of a coalition of six highly armed Arab military armies And yet, even though physically Israel's uh, military was tiny and and basically only composed of volunteers and citizens, and they had uh, inadequate weapons, they had only two dinky little airplanes. Egypt had a massive air force. Israel had these two dinky airplanes. 
uh, a couple of jeeps and Israel's entire military force only consisted of several vehicles captured from her enemies. And so there was this massive war against these six powerful um, uh, Middle Eastern military armies, and Israel won the war. And the prophet Ezekiel uh, predicted this time where the Jewish people, who, who were the valley which was full of dry bones, um, that's what Israel became. After Israel was invaded by the Roman general Titus, after Christ was crucified and ascended to heaven, after the Jews were sold into slavery into all the four corners of the world, Israel became a, a land of dry bones. It was dead, spiritually and physically. And um, on top of that, one thinks of, of when you read the prophecy, the valley which was full of dry bones. Some people believe that refers to the uh, horrific pictures that come out of the Holocaust in World War II. And you've seen the, 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 the horrible black and white pictures of huge pits of naked, uh, emaciating, emaciated, starving, skeletal remains of, of dead bodies piled up who were the victims of the Nazi death camps. That's as, as horrifying as that is to describe. Um, it would constitute a, a valley of, full of dry bones. And um, all of this, before all of this, Ezekiel um, has an encounter with the Lord. And the Lord asks uh, the prophet Ezekiel 25 centuries ago, the Lord asks Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I answered, I being Ezekiel. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Yet God told Ezekiel to watch a miraculous resurrection of these dry bones. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, so you have to think of like 1947, when those, or 1946 or whatever, whenever those horrible pictures of piles of dead Jewish bodies, the horror of that, and God asks Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And the Spirit of the Lord flows out of Ezekiel and on to the dry bones. And many people, even in Israel, believe that the, the coming alive of Jerusalem and Israel as the Jews return to their promised land in 1948, and from a dry, dead, no agricultural dust bowl, when the Jews return, it's like the, the spirit of life. The spirit that comes on the dry bones comes on the, the land of Israel, the land of Jerusalem, and it becomes fruitful, not only in agricultural and crops, but technology and medicine. And it, it, it becomes a, Israel and Jerusalem become a, an extremely exceptional place globally and throughout the Middle East. It's, it's like a, a beautiful flower that blooms in the desert. So, it says, an exceedingly great army stood up as the breath of the Lord came upon them. That speaks of the rebirth of Israel and the rebirth of Israel's military. Israel has more than a third 
uh, the third most powerful air force in the world. That's a lot. Um, Israel possesses more tanks than any other nation than the United States and Russia. And the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, have such advanced military technology and tactics that military analysts consider it the third or fourth most powerful military army on the face of the earth. That's a lot for the, for the small nation that it is. Because Israel only occupies a, a physical land size about the size of New Jersey in the United States, or only one half the size of a tiny nation like Switzerland. Yet despite its physically tiny size, uh, Israel, and the fact that its population uh, is somewhere between five and six million people, Israel has um, become one of the most important nations in, of the world. In fact, half of the resolutions that are made in the United Nations General Assembly during the last decade or so uh, are resolutions that concern Israel. Um, and Israel is the, the object of the total hatred of Russia, um, Iran, and Arab nations, and many third world nations. So, so then we have the prophet Zechariah making a prophecy over 2,500 years ago. And, and Zechariah says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a, couple of, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in the day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered against it. That's Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. So at some time in the future, the, the global hatred for Israel is going to boil over. Jerusalem will be a cup of trembling uh, to, to all the nations around it. They'll become, they already are obsessed with it, but they will, they'll go hysterical with hatred. And uh, then they're going to invade Israel. Now, this was prophesied over 2,500 years ago by Ezekiel that an invasion by Russia, which is referred to as Magog in that passage of Scripture, so Russia or Magog and her allies Ezekiel says that um, Israel would be reborn as a nation, which it was in 1948. And then Russia and her allies would attack Israel with the goal to completely wipe Israel off the face of the map, which is the exact words that, for example, the, the former Palestinian Liberation Organization Terrorists said that the, that the goal of, of militant Islam was to wipe Israel off the map. And um, um, in this prophecy, um, we see that is, is, uh, the prophet Ezekiel um, prophesies not using the modern names uh, of these nations, but using their Old Testament nation, na names. But the names that are referred to in this prophecy by Ezekiel, he's actually referring to nations like Russia, Germany, Syria, because he's using their modern names. And, and he refers to them by the names of the ancient tribes that occupied the exact same geographical territories in their time 
as, for example, the territory modern Russia or modern Syria or modern Germany would, uh, would occupy today. And so in Ezekiel 38, there's a uh, massive future Russian Arab invasion of the land of Israel, of the land of Israel. But what is most interesting about this massive future invasion of the land of Israel is that Israel defeats supernaturally this massive military invasion. But the most important thing at all, of all is it is not actually Israel. It is not actually Israel's military force. It's not Israel's uh, military weaponry that actually causes them to be victorious against their invaders. What becomes quite clear when this Ezekiel um, chapter 38 war of Gog and Magog occurs, what's, what, the, what is the most clear about this invasion is that it is obvious that it is the God of Israel, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the biblical God. It's it's obvious by the way the enemy is defeated that it is God Almighty uh, honoring his Abrahamic covenant with the nation of Israel, that it is God himself who defeats all these uh, enemy armies. The victory will not be attributed to any superiority or wisdom of the Jewish military or the land of Israel. Because they didn't, they will not be the ones that won this victory. It will be apparent to the entire world and the global media that the victory was won by God. So the Lord warns the leader of Russia um, in this prophecy, and the leader of Russia is, is Gog, who's the ruler of Magog, Russia. And Ezekiel says, quote, Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company. And then it says in this prophecy, where the Lord is warning Russia um, to be prepared, and that the leader of Russia is prepared because this is what the word of the Lord says as he's warning the company of Russia or the army of Russia that are assembled God warns them to be thou a guard unto them after many days thou shall be visited in the latter years Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, and it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Ezekiel chapter 38, 7 to 9. So we have to remember when we go back to the the global flood of Noah, global uh, Noah and his sons and their wives survived. And then the the sons of Noah and the grandsons of Noah, they settled in different parts of Asia, Europe, and Africa. And when you read Genesis chapter 10, often referred to as the nations of Ezekiel chapter 38, the nations in um, Genesis 10 give us the ancient genealogy of the very same nations and tribes that are later referred to by the prophet Ezekiel 
in this prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 to 6. So, for example, uh, ancient historians interpreted <clears throat> and explained for us today that most of these tribes that are referred to are tribes that existed under the names at the time of the writing of, of Ezekiel. And so many Jewish and Christian scholars conclude that the tribes referred to by Ezekiel that are found in what's called the list of nations um, refer to modern nations. So, for example, I'm going to read you the ancient nation's name first and then what that nation is called today. So, if you read the prophet Ezekiel, if you read chapter 38, verses 1 to 6, you're going to see the list of all these names I'm going to read to you. And all these names are, the, are nations which have a modern name today. So, for example, Ezekiel 38 refers to Gog and Magog. That refers to modern Russia. Um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel refers to Meshach and Tubal, which refers to, to a uh, nation or territory somewhere in Russia. Uh, Ezekiel re refers to the nation of Persia, which refers to modern Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And again, to show you the relevance of the Bible up to this second, Persia, ancient Persia, which is actually modern Iran, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, all, all of what happened in, in, in the relatively recent Past with the taking out with a drone strike of a major terrorist leader who was responsible for the Iranian interference in modern Iraq. I mean, I mean, it's this is amazing. These nations are the very nations: Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Where is American military? influence or concern throughout the world focused in on right now? Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, which were all part of ancient Persia when Ezekiel made the prophecy. What's one of the number one nations America is concerned with today? Russia, which is referred to in Ezekiel's prophecy as Gog and Magog. And then you have... Uh, Ethiopia, which is referred to today as Ethiopia and modern Sudan. You have uh, Libya, which is still Libya today in our modern world. And then you have Ashkenaz, which um, Ezekiel prophesied about. And what is Ashkenaz today? It's modern Austria and Germany. And then you have Gomer. Well, who's Gomer? Gomer today is known as Eastern Europe, many of them part of the former communist bloc nations. And then you have Ezekiel's prophecy of the ancient na nation of Togarma. Well, who's Togarma? Today, Togarma is Southeastern Europe, Turkey. Turkey, there was a huge Turkish, uh, I believe it was a journalist who was uh, assassinated. So all the, these nations that um, Ezekiel is making ancient prophecies about, are, these nations are in flashing uh, uh, red lights today in our news. And then when it also says in Ezekiel, and many nations with you, that is a reference to all the nations that are allied to Russia. Now, if that's not enough to blow your mind, and by the way, I detail... I detail this information along with a lot more information, which you should read in my book, The Day the Dollar Died. <clears throat> um, I also get into how Britain is involved in this biblical prophecy. 
um, in my new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. I go into this prophecy and its implications, a prophecy of the future of America. In that book, I go into different areas. So all these books that I've written are not standalone books. They're supposed to be read one after another <clears throat> because books like uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, uh, The Day the Dollar Died, um, <clears throat> Mass Awakening, um, a um, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world <clears throat> all deal with the Ezekiel 38 <clears throat> prophecy and China and even uh, uh, my Matrix book, um, Conquering the Matrix, deals with this. And in the new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, I deal heavily with China. You say, well, what does China have to do with Ezekiel 38? Everything. Let me just give you one thing among everything that it has everything to deal with Bible prophecy. If you visit the Great Wall of China, One of the reasons, and a lot of people don't understand this, but one of the primary reasons that the Great Wall of China was built by the ancient Chinese Empire is that the ancient Chinese Empire uh, had enemies in Mongolia and Siberia, and they would regularly attack China. So. China built up this massive wall, military defense wall, to protect China, but specifically uh, protect China in, in problem locations, such as the exact areas where Mongolia and Siberia would regularly invade China. They had to build up the Great Wall of China to protect themselves against that. But that's just the beginning of the mind-blowing trip. Um, the, the, sometimes the Great Wall of China is built in this ridiculously rugged uh, terrain and, and, and impossible geographic places. But the reason it was built in these impossible geographic places the reason that the Chinese Empire built up, for example, their Great Wall of China in some very rugged places was because they, they wanted a Great Wall of China as a barrier and a protection between uh, the ancient empire of China and what the Chinese Empire called the Great uh, the, the wall of Al-Magog. So the ancient Chinese empire was building up the Great Wall of China as a defense against, or known as, the Wall of Al-Magog. Why? Because the Great Wall of, quote, Al-Magog, built by the ancient Chinese empire, was built to keep out the invading armies from Magog, and of course, Magog is Russia. So there are, there are segments of the Great Wall of China, which are called the Wall of Al-Magog, spe specifically because it was, was built to defend uh, China from the armies of Magog, which is Russia. I mean, I, this is so mind-blowing, it's, it's, it's hard to fathom. Now, Russia, of course, is critical in this Bible prophecy because the names Gog and Magog, uh, going back to ancient uh, Jewish rabbinical writings, going back to the, the writing of the Bible, and we read continually in the Bible that the great war of Gog and Magog that was predicted by the, the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 38 to 39 
as well as in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Because in Revelation, chapter 20, um, there is going to be, and we'll get into it into another show, a very mysterious uprising where millions of people will once again, after, after the millennium begins, and everything seems peaceful and stuff, there is this uprising um, by what's called Gog and Magog, which is led by Satan uh, in, the, in the final, final, final attack uh, against Jerusalem. Now, that, that gets very complicated, I realize. But the point is that, um, well, I don't want to do it. It deserves an answer, but it's going to take about three shows to get into it, the differences between these battles. The point is, is that in the first war of Gog and Magog, before the millennium, Russia is leading this attack, a Russia-Arab invasion against Israel. And in the second war of Gog and Magog, and, and people don't, they don't properly separate the two, the second war of Gog and Magog, which takes place during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, this um, second war, some people say, it will be known as the Battle of Armageddon. That, that's very debatable. I, again, I, I want to avoid that for the moment. But the point is, that um, there is this last day's invasion um, led by Russia against the nation of Israel. And uh, that um, it features a conflict with Iran, Russia, um, and other nations. But the thing that's the most amazing thing about it is that it's not the Jews that are successful in in the overthrow. It is the uh, you know what I have to do another show on this because it's just too incredible. There's so much to dip into that is so absolutely important to this. That's so relevant to this day, um, and that has to do with. Uh, uh, the true nature of Russia, Russia's uh, uh, lineage, uh, the sons of Noah, and then as you get into a, a world empire, um, you have to understand the, the ancient and prophetic role that Great Britain plays in, in this entire event. And, and many people don't understand that. And I don't believe that the Bible specifically, uh, with 100% clarity, uh, uh, refers to the United States. But there, but there is, there, there are, are prophetic links between America, Great Britain, the United States, and so on and so forth, that go way back into biblical history. And we didn't even touch on that today. And it's important stuff, because the global government that's rising all around us is essentially powered by international globalists, but especially empowered by the international globalists who uh, are part of the United States of America and Great Britain. They, they lead this this uh, one world government and have been leading this one world government uh, for quite some time. They're the they're the head of the global uh, economic system, the global religion, and the the global uh, government. And uh, this is important, very very important to understand. It's all interconnected. Now, I want to just give you a hint of what I'm talking about. For example, you can't understand the global financial crisis 
without understanding Ezekiel chapter 38, the prophecy of the war of Gog and Magog. Um, and again, if, if you will read the books I've written as a set, because they, they are a set, like The Day the Dollar Died, um, a Prophecy of the Future of America, a Conquering the Matrix, um, the latest book, the, the Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. You see, in, in one book after another, a direct connection as well as how it amplifies, of, for example, the truths of Ezekiel 38, which not only um, are part of the truths of the Pilgrims and Puritans who settled the United States of America, but you have to have a deep understanding of it. Are you really, you're going to be as clueless as the people who run the cartoon channels, and by that I mean the mainstream media news channels. So, what we have, and what is so important to grip, is that in Ezekiel 38, um, you know, what people are asking themselves right now is this question. Was this current taking out of a major terrorist leader, which is really a strike against Iran, is it going to be the beginning of, uh, well, they say Armageddon, but what they really mean is the beginning of the war of Gog and Magog. Now, ironically, in my book, The Day the Dollar Died, I have a chapter entitled Ezekiel 38, Strike on Iran, Beginning of War of Gog and Magog. <laughs> so, this question keeps being asked. Now, I, w- I want to read you or, or pluck out some things from this chapter. And uh, this book is as relevant today as it was when it was written. This book was copyrighted in 2009. Here we are a decade later, and we're at the exact s- same precipice of a War and Gog and Magog War. So, what they were planning, and they have continued to work on, when I first wrote The Day the Dollar Died, was the pipeline that was planned from the Caspian Sea, which is bringing in uh, one million barrels a day of non-Russian oil, through Georgia to Turkey, and not not U.S. Georgia, but European Georgia, uh, and the Mediterranean Sea. And Putin wants to control those pipelines and dominate Persian oil and Caspian oil. So, this, when, when I wrote The Day the Dollar Died, the scenario, I wrote, the scenario could play out like this. Israel strikes Iran. Hezbollah in Lebanon has 40,000 rockets aimed at Israel in the south. Gaza is another Iranian-backed regime. Hamas is prepared to hit Israel with force. Syria may also strike Israel. The situation escalates with the possibility of Russia moving into the Middle East conflict and taking control of the Strait of Hormuz, which gives Russia control of 40% of the world's oil. The result would be a devastating blow to the U.S. and EU economies, which were already in crisis. Now, the contrast between what I just read you and and what's happening now is um, some of these elements are still flashing red lights. At the present moment, it appears Russia is functioning for its own economic reasons as our proxy. Uh, in the negotiations with Iran, etc. Because Russia has the opportunity to make a lot of money, uh, an economic incentive in this. So, so some things have changed. Other things have not changed. Now, the um, other thing that we need to know, and I write about this in The Day the Dollar Died, 
that in the nations of Ezekiel 38, there are some Bible scholars who believe Gog is not the name of a nation, but a title. It has been likened to the modern term dictator. Gog is the ruler of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. I'm reading from the day the dollar died. The ruler over the land of Magog. Rush means the Russians. The Greeks mean Moshe and is derived from the Hebrew Meshech, which is the source of the name Moscow. Tubal in the Hebrew is either Thobal or Thubal and can be identified with the Siberian city of Tobolsk, situated on the river Tubal. In, um, in recent years, this city has become more important as a major center of the royal uh, Russian oil industry. The land of Gog and Magog could be Russia. Central Europe is covered by Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Holland. Gomar represents the nation of Western Europe, compromising of France, Belgium, and Switzerland. Persia changed its name in 1935 to Iran. Ethiopia is modern Ethiopia. Libya is modern Libya. And Togomar could either be Turkey, Sheba, and Dedan is Saudi Arabia. And the Gulf states of the United Emirates or Saudi Arabia. Now, here's where it becomes um, uh, conflicting, and and I'm I'm reading you, reading to you from the day the do- the day the dollar died, but I'm not reading it as this is quote thus saith the Lord. I'm reading I'm saying this is what some Bible prophecy scholars believe. Um, some Bible prophecy. Uh, scholars speculate that America could be, quote, the merchants of Tarshish that are re- uh, referred to by the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 27, verse 12. Now, in that ancient prophecy, the ancient Phoenicians traded with Tarshish, and one of the chief products was tin. So at that time in ancient history, tin was a very important metal, and, and, and a nation could make a lot of money by selling, importing, and exporting tin. Great Britain was one of the world's greatest importers and exporters of tin, and that was one of the prize, primary reasons Britain, ancient Britain, rose to prominence economically, because they had control over the tin market. Now, in Ezekiel uh, uh, chapter 27, verse 12, the ancient Phoenicians traded with Tarshish, and one of the main chief products was tin. Some scholars believe the name Britain comes from the Phoenician word for tin, which is Baratanak, means the isles or land of tin. So, Some scholars believe that the ancient Phoenician word for Great Britain comes from the Isles or Land of Tin. Great Britain is America's largest investor. Think international bankers. Think Rothschild banking family. Think Rothschild banking family controlling, for example, Rockefeller banking family. Um... And, of course, Rothschild is headquartered in Britain. Another indicator of the power that opposes the, the Russian uh, invasion of uh, Israel is that Great Britain is probably the, the number one major international provider of money and capital. Britain is the largest single investor in the U.S., The young lions of Tarshish, now this is a a biblical term, the young lions of Tarshish, remember Tarshish refers to Great Britain, so we could say the young lions of ancient Great Britain, or the young lions of Tarshish, had their origins in Britain. If the countries that can trace their ancestry to Tarshish are the young lions, then Tarshish must be the old lion. The iron is a symbol of, excuse me, not the iron, the lion is a symbol of Britain. The young lions of Tarshish could represent 
the United States of America, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, all of which had their origins in Britain and all of which were former colonies of Great Britain. Um, however, as I write in The Day the Dollar Died, when Russia invades Israel with Iran, will the, the nations that compose the young lions of Tarshish, like America, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, New Zealand actually do anything? I mean, will we actually get involved militarily, or will we simply verbally protest what's going on? Because there may be a secret reason behind why all this is happening that has to do with the global currency. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, and I deal with this in great detail in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. But when it comes to the modern communist nation of Venezuela and uh, the fact that there are Russian ships with nuclear weapons that regularly go through the Panama Canal and are near Venezuela and Cuba, those, those, those are all very close to, to the USA. Will America really uh, risk its own uh, safety fighting off an invasion against Israel? So, we see that these ancient biblical prophecies, especially the War of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel chapter 38, are were relevant when the prophet Ezekiel made them, and they're relevant right up to the moment. Now, look, any way you slice it, knowing the biblical and historical background of the current Middle Eastern crisis, especially with Iran and Russia, is mandatory. If somebody calls themselves a news service, and they never, ever, ever deal with this, which they don't, uh, you're, you're watching the Cartoon Channel. So Cartoon Channel is great if you're four years old, three years old, two years old, six or seven years old. The Cartoon Channel is fine. I guess it's fine. I don't know. I've never watched it. But for grown adults to watch the Cartoon Channels or the mainstream media, and then for you and I to listen to their opinion is ridiculous. I don't listen to people's opinion. Who, who, when, I, when somebody comes up to me, because they know what I do or whatever, and wants to get into a debate or discuss something. And, and they may, may even be a Christian. I'm not going to be rude, but after listening to them talk for two or three minutes, it's obvious to me that they have the intelligence, knowledge, and information level of somebody who's been locked in a room and only watches the cartoon channel. Am I going to sit there and continue to listen? I'm not going to be rude. I'll just say, excuse me, and I, I, I'll be very polite, and I'll say, excuse me, and I'll walk away. I'm not, I'm not going to listen to somebody who watches the Cartoon Channel and dignify their opinion by listening to them, and you shouldn't either. I mean, you shouldn't be social. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you should be rude. No, but the goal is not being rude, but to take somebody's opinion seriously, whose opinion was formed by the Cartoon Channel, is ridiculous. And I, and I don't. I'm not saying that to be antagonistic. It's just simply that at a certain point, you can't keep feeding the power of stupidity by by taking it seriously. This is the Paul McGuire report. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes the truth packs a wallop. Sometimes the truth opens your eyes. Sometimes the truth is not welcome. But ultimately, the truth will always set you free. Jesus Christ said, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." That's one of the reasons you can listen to the Paul McGuire Report and help spread the Paul McGuire Report by sending this link to your friends. We are able to conduct this ministry because of your prayers and spiritual warfare, because of your willingness to spread links of this program, and finally because you uh, help us by making financial contributions and financial donations. All of this represents partnership with us, and without your partnership, 
we could not continue to minister. We minister because of your obedience to the Lord. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I don't take your obedience uh, to the Lord for granted. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. By the way, we have coming up in just a week or so another Paradise Mountain Church meeting. It's uh, Thursday, January 30th, and uh, I would love to see you there. You can get more information at paulmcguire.us. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Thank you.